Well, good morning, ladies. Today we're going to be heading through chapters 25 and 26. They're killing us, aren't they, with all these chapters in one week? But I love the title of this week's study as it's called A Greater Perspective. Don't you just desire a greater perspective? I was just dwelling on that this week, and I need a greater perspective as we get so easily caught up in the things that are going on in this world. Well, Paul is a great example of that. Last time we were together, we left off with Paul there in Caesarea. He was in prison, incarcerated, and we saw that this time Jesus didn't open the prison doors for him, but he appeared to him in prison. He was with him, and he spoke words of comfort to him. And we saw that when Felix heard Paul's testimony, and he heard the gospel that Paul shared, he was afraid. And he sent Paul away until a more convenient time. You see, he wanted to please the Jews. He was more fearful of the Jews and having an uproar caused under his leadership under Rome than he was in fear of God. And he was secretly hoping, as he called Paul to himself on numerous occasions, he was secretly hoping that Paul would give him a bribe, that he would be able to get money so that he could be released. But we realize that Paul's imprisonment was actually the sovereignty of God in that it actually protected him from the Jews who wanted to kill him. And we see that that continues today. So still, in Caesarea, after two years of imprisonment now, Nero replaces Felix with Festus, the governor. And Paul has had to defend himself three times. He's had to defend his faith three times so far against those who had false charges against him. First, there was the angry mob. Then it was the Sanhedrin. Then it was Felix. And today we see two more times that he must defend himself. And that is against with Festus and then with King Agrippa, which brings us to chapter 25 as we revisit the plot to kill Paul and the charges against him. In fact, in chapter 25 alone, I counted 11 times the word against, coming against Paul 11 times. And so now in Acts 25, verse 1, when Festus had come to the province after three days, he went up from Caesarea to Jerusalem. Then the high priest, now that Ananias is dead, there's a new high priest, and the chief men of the Jews informed him against Paul. And they petitioned him, asking a favor against him, that he would... Uh, summon him to Jerusalem while they lay and wait um, uh, in ambush along the road to kill him. In other words, they were asking him to, to bring Paul from, Jer or from Caesarea to Jerusalem because those Jews were lying in wait. They didn't admit that necessarily, but that's what their heart was. So it could be the same group of those 40 Jews that made the rash vow that we saw last week that said they would neither eat nor drink until Paul was dead. Well, either they're dead because this is two years later and you can't go two years without food and water, or their pride was crushed in the fact that they had to eat and drink. And now their embitterment is so much worse because they were proved wrong or it's possible that this is a new group of Jews because that first group did die. Um, but either way, the hatred of the Jewish people against Paul is growing. And in verse 4, but Festus answered that Paul should be kept at Caesarea and that he himself was going there shortly. So we see God intervene. We see the sovereign hand of God on Paul's life because it, it, we know that he visited him and told him he was going to Rome. So we knew it wasn't going to end here. But this is so encouraging, especially with all that's happening in our country today, isn't it? Even in our little county here, as we're getting ready to have some no parking signs go up on Bucharest Lane because the wineries in the county have gotten together. They're just trying to figure out how to be an irritant to us. So now they can take away our parking. It, it's unbelievable, the stuff that, that goes on. But Proverbs 21.1 tells us that the king's heart is in the hand of the Lord. And like the rivers of water, he turns it wherever he wishes. I love the fact that our God is in control. And what can man do to us? Take away a few parking spots? Kill our body, which is just temporary anyway. But we're going to live throughout eternity. So in that perspective, that greater perspective is none of us even matters because it's all temporary. We have a living hope and we look towards that. The truth is our God is Jehovah Sabaoth. 
That is a title for God that emphasizes God's rule over every other power and material and spiritual universe that there is. The Jehovah Sabaoth, the name or the title for God, is mentioned more than 240 times throughout the Bible in the Old Testament alone, meaning that everything is subject to God, including the cherubim, the seraphim, the sun, the moon, the stars, the river, the sky, the mountain, the hail, the snow, the men and women, and all kinds of animals. We see it over and over again with the ravens who fed Elijah in the wilderness, the pillar of fire and the cloud, cover of cloud by day with the children of Israel. Like in Mark 4.39, when the disciples were in the storm on the Sea of Galilee, it tells us that Jesus actually rose up and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace, be still. And the disciples said to one another as they marveled, Who can this be that even the wind and the sea obey him? Ladies, we serve Jehovah Sabaoth. He's a big God, amen? And you know what? It doesn't matter what is going on in this world, God is in control and he will have the final say. So Jehovah Sabaoth means that the Lord, the Lord is, is ho Lord of hosts. He is God Almighty and it points to the sovereignty of our God and how all creation serves his purpose and what peace that will bring as we take a step back and out of our circumstances that are swirling around us and we know that he's Jehovah Sabaoth. And that is what gave Paul a greater perspective, no doubt. Well, back to verse 5, it says, Therefore Festus said, Let those who have authority among you go down with me and accuse this man to see if there's any fault in him. Now, that's totally reasonable. Let the accusers come to him, and if there's a fault, then let us hear it. Verse 6, And when he had remained among them more than ten days, he went down to Caesarea, and the next day, sitting on the judgment seat, he commanded Paul to be brought. And when he had come, the Jews who had come down from Jerusalem stood about and laid many serious complaints against Paul, which they could not prove. As believers, this concept is so vital because people will say things about us. The Bible promises us that people will bring accusations against us. But like with Paul, it's important that they cannot prove it. It's important that we are above reproach as things are, are thrown at us that it's not true. In other words, Paul was blameless. We looked at that last week. In fact, in, in 40, 47 times throughout the Bible, it tells us that you and I are to be blameless. 2 Peter 3.14 tells us that as we look forward to his promise of the new heavens and the new earth, which is where righteousness dwells, we are to be diligent to be found it, by him in peace, without spot and blameless. Colossians 1.22 tells us we are to be blameless and above reproach in his sight. 1 Timothy 6.14 tells us to keep this commandment of love without spot, being blameless until the Lord Christ, Lord Jesus is appearing. You get the picture. It just goes on and on. We are called to be blameless. While accusations will come, they just can't be true. Even if people believe the accusations, even if the newspapers report the accusations, it doesn't matter because God knows and we need to be okay with that as we have that greater perspective. In fact, in 1 Peter 3, uh, 14, Peter goes on to say, even if you should suffer for righteousness sake, you are blessed. And then he goes on, says, do not be afraid of the threats, nor be troubled, but sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and always be ready to give a defense to uh, everyone who asks you for the reason, for the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. And then in verse 16, it's, it clarifies and says, having a good conscience so that when they defame you as evildoers, those who revile your good conduct in Christ may be ashamed for it is better if it is the will of God to suffer for doing good than for doing evil. And what a picture of Paul. I couldn't help but think maybe Peter was thinking of Paul at this time. Well, back to verse 8, where Paul declares his innocence. In verse 8, while he answered for himself, neither against the law of the Jews, nor against the temple, nor against Caesar, have I offended in anything at all. In other words, all of their accusations are false. Verse 9, but Festus, wanting to do the Jews a favor, 
You got to understand that under Felix, we, we looked at this last week, Felix had so many uprisings under his, his leadership that he actually was removed after eight years because that was a big no-no under Rome. Rome did not like uprisings. They ruled with an iron fist, and if the people were having a lot of uprisings, that meant that the leader was not a good leader. So Festus doesn't want to have all these uprisings with the Jews. He wants to do the Jews a favor keep calm in his land. And so he answered and said, are you willing to go up to Jerusalem there and be judged before me concerning these things? So again, trying to put him back into the hands of the religious leaders, trying to wash his hands of Rome, the, the civil issue, get him back to the religious leaders because this seems to be what the problem was, was a religious problem. And then in verse 10, Paul being a Roman, as he had every right to appeal to Rome, Said So Paul said, I stand at Caesar's judgment seat where I ought to be judged. To the Jews I have done no wrong, as you very well know. For if I am an offender or have committed anything deserving of death, I do not object to dying. But if there is nothing in these things of which these men accuse me, no one can deliver me to them. I appeal to Caesar, which would be like appealing to the Supreme Court of the day. Now, what is interesting to me is that as Paul appeals specifically to Caesar there in Rome, maybe it was because, number one, he thought Festus was sympathetic towards his accusers and he had no chance and he would have a better chance if he would appear before Nero. But at first, that didn't make sense to me because anybody that studied Nero, you know he was an evil, 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 evil guy against Christians to the point where he would take Christians that were alive, dip them in boiling tar, impale them on a pole, erect them in his garden and light them as torches for his night in his garden. That's how much he hated and despised believers. So it didn't make sense that Paul would appeal to Nero. But as I did my study, I found out that this was during the first five years of Nero's reign when he was regarded to be a wise and just ruler, even though he would become an opponent of the way, which is very interesting, which we'll look at again in a minute. Now, it could have been, and it most likely was, that he appealed to Nero because the spirit led him to do so. Because remember when God met Paul in his jail cell? And he said, do not be afraid. And he spoke words of comfort and said, you will go to Rome. Remember that? So it's very possible that Paul is just thinking, whoa, here's my ticket to Rome. This is exactly what God said was going to happen. I get to go to Rome and I can appeal to Caesar. So then in back, verse, in, back in verse 12, it says, Then Festus, when he had conferred with the council, answered, You have appealed to Caesar? To Caesar you shall go. So Paul has no idea what is about to come other than that God said he was going to go to Rome. Now, again, what I thought was interesting was as we have the opportunity to look back at what happened, we see God's grace upon Nero at this point while he was still a good and equitable real ruler because God sent Paul to Nero to preach the gospel and to give his testimony. And I immediately... When I thought of that and how wicked Nero became against the way, I thought back to Pharaoh when Moses was standing before him, pleading on behalf of God's people as God sent him to him. He saw miracle after miracle after miracle, yet it says that Pharaoh hardened his heart to the point that eventually God gave Pharaoh what he wanted and went ahead and solidified his decision in hardening his heart. God said, have it your way. But it wasn't because he hadn't heard the truth. And I thought how sad that is, even in our day-to-day, -day, that people can hear the gospel, they understand the gospel, but because they love darkness rather than light, they harden their heart against it. Yet, that just shows how much God loves us, doesn't it? Because he doesn't force himself on us, he allows us to choose so Paul's appeal to Caesar was an opportunity to get to Rome, fulfilling not only the Holy Spirit's purpose of going before him and going to Rome. In Acts 19 and 23, it says that he would stand before rulers and kings and share his testimony, but also fulfilling a longtime desire of Paul to visit the Christians in Rome, according to Romans 1. So in verses 13 through 27, Festus refers to Paul or refers Paul to Agrippa. 
In verse 13, and after some days, King Agrippa, now this is this King Agrippa II, which is the great-grandson of Herod the Great. So King Agrippa II and Bernice, which was, now this is where it gets confusing, and I probably have it wrong, but Bernice was Festus's wife, and Drusilla's, and, or Drusilla was Felix's wife, and this Agrippa and Bernice's sister, it was Agrippa and Bernice's sister, this Drusilla was, which means they were husband and wife, but brother and sister. Ew, that's like called incest, if you don't know. But they came to Caesarea to greet Festus, their brother-in-law, if you will. And when they had been there many days, Festus laid Paul's case before the king. So here, Festus has Agrippa hear Paul's case because he was known to be an expert in Jewish customs and religious matters. And 14 continues saying, there is a certain man left a prisoner by Felix. In other words, you, you've got a gift. You've been in role for three weeks, and now you get to deal with this situation that Felix left. But about whom the chief priests and the elders of the Jews informed me when I was in Jerusalem asking for a judgment against him. So Paul seems to be the one on trial, doesn't he? You think of Paul, he's the one that's imprisoned, he's chained, he's the one that has the, the accusations coming against him. But as we have a greater perspective, we really see that these guys are the ones on trial in their licentious lifestyle, in their rejection of Jesus as the Messiah. So then the truth of God's word comes to them. And in verse 16, Festus tells Agrippa, to them I answered, it's not the custom of the Romans to deliver any man to destruction before the accused meets the accusers face to face. That's equitable and has opportunity to answer for himself concerning the charge against him. Therefore, when they had come together without any delay, the next day I sent a judgment seat, sent, uh, sat on the judgment seat and commanded the man to be brought in. When the accusers stood up, they brought no accusations against him of such things as I supposed but had some questions against him about their own religion and about a certain Jesus who died, whom Paul affirmed to be alive. And because I was uncertain of such questions, I asked whether he was willing to go to Jerusalem and there be judged concerning these matters since they were religious matters. But when Paul appealed to be reserved for the decision of Augustus, which was a title of all Caesars, I commanded him to be kept till I could send him to Caesar, which at this time would be Nero. Then Agrippa, in verse 22, said to Festus, I also would like to hear the man myself. Tomorrow, he said, you shall hear him. So the next day, when Agrippa and Bernice had come with great pomp, or fantasia, or bells and whistles, he had entered the auditorium, and the commanders and the prominent men of the city, at Festus's command, Paul was brought in. Now, this theater, if it were in the theater, holds 4,000 people. On top of all this pomp and circumstance of all the leaders and the government officials and the commanders, and it, you get the picture. It was a huge deal. Now, the word fantasia was used, I believe, to give the point of a contrast. Because you can only picture with the Roman elites as they came in with all of their fancy clothing and they, had, they were healthy, they were strong, they were warriors, they were officers, they were, you know, the Roman, I mean, just picture those movies, you know, the Romans coming in. And, and in contrast to that, you've got Paul standing there. Paul, who was getting up in age, he had a thorn of his flesh, whatever that was that made him sick or needing medical attention. And in 2 Corinthians 10.10, 10, it tells us that while his letters were powerful, that he himself was weak in appearance and his speech was contemptible. So you can picture this little scrawny man that's broken and huddled, hunched over that's chained in contrast to all of these Roman officials. Now perhaps this is why it would say in 1 Corinthians 1.27 where Paul said God chooses the foolish, the weak, the abased things of the world to display his power and glory. You see, things are not as they seem. Things are not what we see with our physical eyes. God's view is totally opposite of what we see. So in Acts 12, Agrippa's father, we saw, was printed, presented the gospel of Jesus 
and he refused. And this is what really hit me, is here you got King Agrippa II. He had to have known about his father when Paul stood before his father. And when he refused the gospel, he was eaten from worms from the inside out because he received the glory that was due to God. And now in verse 24, he's standing before his son, the most powerful, prominent men in the region, and it's his son's turn to hear what Paul has to say. I would think he would be a little fearful, but he doesn't seem to be. In verse 24, and Festus said, King Agrippa and all the men who were here present with us, you see this man uh, uh, whom the whole assembly of the Jews petitioned me, both at Jerusalem and here, crying out that he was not fit to live any longer. Really? Saying that he was worthy of death and he had not done anything that they could prove. But when I found that he had committed nothing deserving of death and that he himself had appealed to Augustus or Nero, I decided to send him. I have nothing certain to write to my Lord concerning him. Therefore, I have brought him out before you and especially before you, King Agrippa, so that you, after the examination has taken place, I may have something to write. In other words, help me out, Agrippa, because I can't find anything to write as I send him to Caesar. I, I don't have any accusations that can stick. So since you're an expert in the law, maybe you can find something that we can write in a letter together. Maybe I'm missing something. And then verse 24, for it seems to be unreasonable to send a prisoner and not specify the charges against him. No doubt the reasonable thing would be to set him free since there was no charges. Then in chapter 26, Paul has his opportunity. And what's so encouraging is the fact that Paul's been incarcerated for two years, examined for two years, and there's absolutely no charges that can stick. In other words, he's innocent, yet he doesn't get bitter. He doesn't give up. Did he have a right to be bitter? Absolutely, I think so, but not if he had a greater perspective because his perspective was on the eternal. Instead, he uses it for a, a platform to share the gospel as he was living with eternity in view. He was focused on Jesus no matter what was happening around him. Again, showing that Paul had the greater perspective. So in verses 1 through 23, we see that Paul recounts his life before Christ. In verse 1, then Agrippa said to Paul, you are permitted to speak for yourself. So Paul stretched out his hand showing... Um, respect for his authority and answered for himself. I think myself happy. I mean, really? He's happy? He's happy after two years of being in prison, chained, standing before these guys again? This word happy means blessed. No doubt he's blessed because he's addressing the prominent men and women of the day with the gospel. He's going to be going before the Supreme Court with the gospel. He knew God was being faithful to his word. Don't you love it when you see prophecy coming to fulfillment? Instead of getting bummed out or bitter or, or stressed, we can go, yes, our God is true. And our faith is in something that is true because our God is faithful to his word. And if he said it, we can say it's going to come to pass. Well, King Agrippa, because today... I shall answer for myself before you concerning all the things of which I am accused by the Jews, especially because you are an expert in all customs and questions which have to do with the Jews. Therefore, I beg you to hear me patiently. My manner of life from my youth, which is, in other words, hold on, I got a long story for you and I'm not going to make it short. From my youth, which was spent from my beginning among my own nation at Jerusalem, all the Jews know. Everyone knew. They knew me from the first, if they were willing to testify that according to the strictest sect of our religion, I lived as a Pharisee. And now, being judged for the hope of the promise made by God to our fathers, speaking of the promise of the prophecy of the coming of Jesus as the Messiah. To this promise, our 12 tribes earnestly serving God day and night hope to attain for this hope's sake, King Agrippa, I am accused by the Jews. In other words, the Jews should have the same hope. The difference is Paul recognized the fulfillment and they didn't. So why should it be thought incredible to, by you that God raises the dead? A reminder that there's nothing too hard for Jehovah Sabaoth. In fact, our hope is in his return that we will live with all eternity with him. And that's what Paul was trying to say as God is keeping us by his power. Then in verse 9, Indeed, I myself thought I must do many things contrary to the name of Jesus of Nazareth. In other words, before Jesus 
Paul counted upon his own abilities to be righteous before God. He was doing what he thought was good works and pleasing God to, to be in favor with God. In verse 10, this I also did in Jerusalem and many of the saints I shut up in prison, having received authority from the chief priests. And when they were put to death, no doubt speaking of Stephen, he said, I cast my vote against them, showing that he was a member also of the Sanhedrin. Verse 11, and I punished them often in every synagogue and compelled them to blaspheme. And being exceedingly enraged against them, I persecuted them even to foreign cities. While thus occupied, or it was with this mindset, as I journeyed to Damascus with authority and commission from the chief priests. And at 13, at midday, O king, along the road, I saw a light from heaven, brighter than the sun, shining around me and those who journeyed with me. And when we all had fallen to the ground, I heard a voice speaking to me and saying in the Hebrew language, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It is hard for you to kick against the goads. Just as we saw back in Acts chapter 9, the goads were sharp sticks that they would poke the oxes to get them to go forward, the oxen, to get them to move forward when they didn't want to. And when they didn't want to, they would kick. But when they would kick, they would go even worse against those sharp sticks. So Jesus says it's hard to kick against the goads. But in verse 16, Jesus said to Paul, rise up and stand to your feet for I have appeared to you for this purpose. I found it also interesting that Jesus said, that when you persecute believers, you're persecuting him. And oh, what a good thing for the church to remember when we are persecuting other believers or other parts of the body of Christ. It's not coming against people. It's coming against God himself. And so in other words, he told him, stand up, get going because I have a purpose for you to fulfill, to make you a minister or a servant and a witness both of the things which you have seen and of the things which I will yet reveal to you. In verse 17, I will deliver you from the Jewish people. He's got a, he, he was told he would be delivered, as well as from the Gentiles to whom I now send you, to open their eyes in order to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and an inheritance among those who are sanctified by faith in me. Therefore, Paul says in verse 19, a King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision, but I declared first to those in Damascus and in Jerusalem and throughout all of the region of Judea and then to the Gentiles that they should repent. They should turn to God and do works befitting of repentance. Paul, we have seen his three missionary journeys. He was tireless in his obedience to what God had called him to do. He truly fulfilled the mission. So Paul was obedient as he was filled with grace. Last night, we talked about this at, at study midweek, how God's grace is for the humble. But it's also at, or Romans 5, 2 that says it's by faith that we access this grace. And as we think about that, it's as we have faith in Jehovah Sabaoth, it's as we have faith in God Almighty, that we realize that it's not in ourselves which causes humility in knowing who God is and who we aren't. And as we put faith in who God is, we access his grace. And what is his grace for? Romans 1.5 tells us that we've received grace and apostleship for obedience. When we put our faith in God and who he is and his abilities, his surpassing abilities beyond our understanding, we access his grace which helps us, enables us to be obedient. It's not that we have to go out and be obedient by golly. It's his grace that causes obedience in our lives. In other words, it's a response to who God is when we put our faith in him. And that was a picture of Paul. Then in verse 21, he goes on and says, For these reasons the Jews seized me in the temple and tried to kill me. Therefore, having obtained help from God to this day, I stand, witnessing both to small and great, saying no other things than those which the prophets and Moses said would come. In other words, he was spoke, speaking only of what the word of God had to say regarding the Messiah. He wasn't making it up. He was sticking strictly to the word of God, that the Christ would suffer that he would be the first to rise from the dead and would proclaim light to the Jewish people and to the Gentiles. Then in verse 24, Festus responds. And thus he made his defense. Festus said with a loud voice, Paul, you are beside yourself. 
Much learning has driven you, driving you mad, or you're crazy. Showing the gospel is foolishness to those who are perishing. But, he said in verse 25, I am not mad, most noble Festus, but speak the words of truth and reason. For the king before whom I also speak freely knows these things. In other words, Agrippa knows he's part Jewish. For I am convinced that none of these things escape escapes his attention since this thing was not done in a corner or in secret. And then in verse 27, he busts King Agrippa. He says, do you believe the prophets? Of course he had to believe the prophets. He was half Jewish. And then he says, I know that you do believe. No doubt heard hitting a nerve. And then in verse 28, we see Agrippa's response, which I believe are the saddest words in the Bible. It says, then Agrippa said to Paul, you are almost, you almost persuaded me to become a Christian. Now, we aren't told what kept Agrippa from confessing Jesus as the Messiah. It could have been the people around him. I mean, all the pomp and circum, all the fantasia, all the fancy, all the money of the world, all the prestige, and all of the, the Roman guards, and all of the people. He had arrived, if you will. This was King Agrippa. And he's got Paul standing before him. And for him to believe, he would have to put himself on Paul's level. He could have been in fear of losing his wife's sister or his sister wife or whatever she was because she was against it. Maybe it was because he just couldn't identify. Maybe he didn't want to look like a fool in front of all the fantasia around him. But whatever the reason, Agrippa almost received salvation. Agrippa almost gained an eternal life instead of eternal condemnation. Agrippa almost was redeemed. But almost doesn't work, does it? It's either we're in or we're not. Almost is so close, but almost is so sad. As he admits that he understands, yet he rejects. And as I thought about Agrippa, I thought he surely knew what happened, as I said, with what his father went through. And it's the same message. So he follows in his father's footsteps of the rejection. And in verse 29, Paul responds. And he said, I would to God that not only you, but also all who hear me today might become both almost and altogether such as I am, except for these chains. In other words, I wish everybody in my hearing would become as I am spiritually, but not physically, not bound in the chains, but, but he was trying to get across that he was free in Christ. He may look like he was bound in chains, but eternally, with that greater perspective, he couldn't be more free than if they set him out and let him go. In other words, I wish you would all believe that you would repent and turn to Jesus for eternal life. Verse 30, when he had said these things, the king stood up as well as the governor and Bernice and those who sat with them. And even though... They rejected Paul's message of salvation. In verse 31, they render a verdict. It says, when they had gone aside, they talked among themselves, saying, this man is doing nothing deserving death or chains. He might be crazy. We might reject his message, but there's no guilt in this man. Then Agrippa said to Festus, this man might have been set free had he not appealed to Caesar. Again, they have no idea how free Paul is and he's free to go and, and witness his testimony in the gospel of Jesus Christ before Nero, doing exactly what God had called him to do. So right there in Caesarea, I love Caesarea. I love when we go to Israel and we go to Caesarea. It's one of my favorite places. It's the, where the Holy Spirit, through Peter, when he went to Caesarea, the Holy Spirit fell upon the Gentiles for the very first time without them having to be converted into Judaism. And it was as he spoke the word of God. This time as the word of God was being spoken, Agrippa rejected it. What a contrast. It not only shows that God does not work in the same way every single time, but also that there's no, no rhyme or reason to where he works or how he works. Also, we cannot choose for someone else. There's no doubt that Paul had the same heart that these people would receive the Holy Spirit coming upon them as Paul experienced. But it wasn't up to Paul. It wasn't up to, to Peter. 
So like Paul, we are to be faithful and obedient regardless, again, we looked at this last week, how others receive it. And I think that's precisely why Paul would write in 1 Corinthians 3, 5, when he said, who then is Paul and who is Apollos, but ministers through whom you believed as the Lord gave to each one. I planted, Apollos watered, but God gives the increase. So neither he who plants nor he who waters is anything, but it's God. It's God who receives the glory. In other words, we're to be recipients of his grace as we have faith in God so that we can be always ready to give an answer for the hope that lies within us with gentleness and respect. Telling everyone we come in contact with about Jesus, realizing that it's not up to us to save people, it's not up to us to, sit, to, to rescue anybody, but it's up to us to live our life as an example so that we can, like Paul, say, follow me as I follow Christ, as we are above reproach and blameless in this rotten world. His grace is what gives us that boldness and ability to live a supernatural life as the work of the Spirit. And that's what this study is all about. It's a work of the Spirit, not of man, not of the apostles, not you and I, but it's simply having faith in a big God who is able to do what he has decided to do. He will accomplish that which we have entrusted to him until that day. Let's pray. Lord, we just thank you so much for your word. Lord, we thank you that your word tells us that it's not by might nor by power, but it's truly by your spirit, says the Lord. And God, when things seem to be falling apart around us in our electorate and everything, Lord, in this world, it just seems to be falling apart. But God, it's falling into place as we have a greater perspective. Because Lord, you tell us that these things are going to happen. Just as you told Paul he was going to Rome and he went to Rome. God, you tell us these things will happen and that you're coming back again one day. And that day is going to be soon and very soon that we will see our king. And Lord, we are just blessed. We thank you that you have chosen us to be a recipient of your grace. As you fill us with your Holy Spirit, we've been saved, we've been filled, we've been redeemed. And God, we can go forth in your grace by your power as your spirit works in and through each and every one of us. God, I pray you would bless these ladies. Bless them abundantly for their faithfulness, for their obedience to your word. God, as they simply respond, as they have faith and they place their hope in you, give us, God, a greater perspective. In Jesus' name, amen.